In this session, our session, in this session, our second speaker, so the ballroom is really crowded. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished players of the actors of the steel producing sector, welcome. We know that, just like it's mentioned, this is a traditional annual conference, a gathering, and I'm really happy to be in such an environment. And I'd like to thank uh, Ardemir Group on behalf of Ardemir Group uh, that you are all welcome. And just like it was uh, mentioned before, we are going through a very fragile stage. And let me explain what kind of stages we are going through. In this market, you, I don't want to go over into too much detail about micro evaluations and so on or in the markets, but for example, there are scrap balances, search for scrap balances, and it's not like uh, there and there will there's a search for confidence and trust and the Chinese situation and there is a trust, uh, whether there will be a trust in the markets in 2015. And as of winter s season, we are quite curious about the effects in the steel market. We can talk about these kinds of issues, but they're already in our lives. This is the nature of steel sector. There are ups and downs. And we're already going through such transformations. So while as we go on, just like Vaisal Bay mentioned and gave some graphics and figures, where are we going and where will we be? And how can we get out of this? And as we go further, we can see we are looking for bigger pictures and how can we uh, settle down and where are we situated? Actually, I would like to go over these topics because in difficult times, it is more easier, much more easier for people to go uh, to think that the markets are going to go down. But as the markets go up, some people uh, claim that the market will go even higher. But the biggest courage is, that, is to see uh, the way out and to show the way out. And this is the courage. And this is not something personal. Actually, we Turkish people, we Turks, go uh, can write a great success stories during challenging times. When we look at our past, in our history, we see a lot of uh, great success stories. So, in order to reach a, a common success story, we need to go over them. We are going, uh, we are following um, the dynamics and through those dynamics we w may miss what kind of stages we have to take. There are a lot of decisions taken by a lot of countries and we are, we have uh, ex explained the 10th development uh, program and the world countries, the countries and their decisions are going to be questioned in our in my presentation so up until 2008 crisis there was another world but afterwards we have gained some speed and as of 2014 we see a lot more effects and changes and the most prominent one is the economic growth this is like a unique growth and Although the politicians strive hard, the growth hasn't reached to an ideal place. We have increasing geopolitical risks and great uh, divergences in the world countries. Maybe it's because of the currency and the devaluation. Maybe in the United States, for example, the liquidity decreasing, the liquidity and the devaluing the uh, 
uh, dollars or the changes in the commodities. We are going through a different, a new stage, a new period, and we consider this as normal because the markets are looking for balances, and nothing is balanced nowadays. In a global world, we believe that the countries and the markets will come to a balance, and then 2015, the year 2015, will be an indicator to it. And where will we be situated as a result? We need to pay attention to it. So we have talked about some increases and in growth, and I would like to give some figures. And as you can see in the graphic in the left in the left stage in the left part, we are talking about the trends, growth trends between 2002 to 2008, the growth there, and between 2010 and the 2012, the numbers are around the same, around three. When we come to 2013, there is a radical radical uh, decrease, and as of 2014, there was an optim optimistic uh, thought, but because of the revision of the growth rate, we believe that the rate will again be around three. But what was the surprise and what changed? Between 20, uh, 2010 and tw 2013, there was a 12% of change, of increase, and in the GDP increase, we see the main dynamic and the main locomotive is the developing countries. And when we come to this stage in the developing countries such as China, the economic growth is slowing down. And as of next year, maybe we, there will be a number, a growth number of 7%. The reason why the, these economies are being called, um, I will be giving you some figures and information in the next slides. One of the most important countries, India, uh, has experienced growth, but still it's not growing as much as it used to be in the past. And also Japan, as in the status of developing country, still experiences, goes over a decrease. And again, in Russia, we see uh, decreases radical decreases and also European countries not being able to develop and there, all, there are digressions going on there and the economic growth, how can we go further the economic growth and how can they be different than the uh, other country has been, have been uh, topics that we are all discussing. Because as of the crisis, 2008 crisis, the politicians have issued money currency and because of that we were in a period of a lot of uh, you know recovery but as you can see in the dark blue colors we see that as of the crisis of 2008 we see a capital flow increase and we see that the, 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 there is a deval deval developed countries a devaluation, but the liquidity decreasing and the f flow of money to the developing countries have may have put the developing countries into a very important stage because with the money coming from abroad, the countries and their activities cannot uh, is in the risk of not being able to activate their money, finance their money. So. Why do they want to quit issuing money? Why do the countries resort to such a thing and why are they um, not taking this? In the developing countries and the, com the, the total debt it was 120 percent and now it's, it's, inc it's increased to 165 percent and this is not a sustainable ratio. Such an economy and the growth of such an economy with a debt, with such a debt in the developing countries have um, cooled the economy, the effectiveness, had a cooling effect. There were also uncontrolled trouble. There was a trouble that, trouble that was uncontrolled. And in many sectors in China, for example, there were some uncontrollable capacities. And not only this is a trouble for a world, but in China, for example, there is a overheating and a balloon effect. 
And also in the USA, there is a great number increase in issuing uh, money, but there are still great, uh, small uh, increases or rapidity, acceleration. But still in the EU, there is a, a deflation risk. So it's not only the politi policymakers. They are also talking about the fact that they are not, it is not possible to get out of the structural reforms but through issuing monetary policies uh, during the period of uh, moderate growth. I would also like to share some figures with you. As you know, there are a lot of changes in the balances in the world. And in many markets, also in the, in the monetary markets, we don't know where the prices are. So we are in search for balances, and there are some irrational uh, pricings as a result. With devaluation uh, of the dollars, we see that there is a de decrease in the uh, decrease in value in the com commodities. But it's not only the supply and demand in the markets or devaluation of the dollars. It's, it doesn't have effect on these factors. There are also other factors that has effect in it. As you can see on the left side, in the graphic on the left side, there is an important indicator. And that is in the industrial uh, commodity index, uh, world GDP index. There is a great correlation, as you can see, an apparent correlation. As of 2005 to 2012, 13, there is an increase of 30 percent. And as the as we in see increases, the commodities have also di directly uh, correlated with that increase. So as of the crisis in 2008, there was a, a narrowing down, but again, in the commodity prices, but then the index have gotten down, has decreased. When we see the recovery stage, the, in, um, the commodity pricing have uh, recovered too, but there is not a complete co recovery in the world. There was, there is not, we cannot talk about only a crisis, a world crisis with a shrinkage, but we can say that the policymakers are not, are actually looking for and talking about what they can do in order to recover. While we talk about growth and while we see, while we, we cannot find the uh, decrease of value in the commodities uh, as rational. So the markets, when they see the normal order, we believe that when they come to such a conclusion, uh, they will see that the commodity pricing will go up and there will be, there will not be, there is not that many kind of expectation. So in the steel sector, we, Basel, for example, have uh, summarized with some numbers, but as a country, we have some problems with regards to steel producing, and it's we are not in a very uh, happy situation. There is a serious situation in here. The changes in the exports and the have come to have stopped or almost have stopped. So. As of the crisis in 2008, there were some increases in excitement, especially China has accelerated its world exports. But now, in the global trade, in, we cannot see that kind of that much of a movement. So this is this indicates the importance of regional markets. The countries nowadays are focused more on uh, protecting their regional uh, markets. And the developed countries in 2005 developed by 62 percent. And when we come to 2013, this, is, this has lost value by 10 percent. And they have increased their shares in the developing countries. Within 10 years of time, Everyone guessed 
more or less about the situation. And the developing countries, we are not sure whether the developing countries will take over those markets. But while they try to keep their regional markets as strong, we are going through a different stage now, a very critical stage. And we always talk about the Chinese factor, for example, about the uncontrollable capacities in, the chi in China and the overcapacities there. But for the past 32 months, uh, the consumption pricing indexes are regressing. So they are continuously lowering down the prices and they are injecting a low price in the world and that means that there will be a deflation in the world that deflation is the great obstacle for the production in the EU countries they always talk about the people are always talking about these issues this is what Japan Japan has been struggling for and as it lowers down it is a great obstacle for the welfare of the countries so the policymakers as they see it, they have, we have seen the effect of it in 2014, and they have now made a protectionist trend. And in the world countries, for example, not in only in the steel sector, but in all sectors, countries are trying to put forward their protectionist measures in order to protect their sectors. And as of 12, uh, 2012 to 2014, we see that there's a great increase in terms of these protectionist measures. And I believe that there, there will be even greater measures with regards to this. And countries, for example, have opened cases or lawsuits uh, against other countries. And we have heard of these even more. And it's because of these trends. And it's because of their regional markets. They want to safeguard their markets. Then their only chances, uh, the, through that, they will increase the chances to protect and to safeguard their markets. Many world leaders, for example, uh, have been talking about uh, in developing their um, markets because countries and the world leaders are the ones who contribute in the sectors. Neither in construction or in agriculture or in uh, trade or in finance sector, the production, the, the production industry is highly important. So there is a very important saying, as there is, the dynamics are highly important for the sectors. Again, when we look at the most important things of the countries, some policies, such as manufacturing sector, also it is focused by the United States as well. It is a very sharp relation. There is a very obvious relation with the employment of the production. Employment, GDP, prosperity, welfare level, it is parallel, it is equivalent to production. When we look at Spain, the blue line shows that industry, industry's ratio in GDP. Post-2008 crisis, there is a very sharp decrease in the manufacturing sector. As you can see, unemployment ratio is increasing radically when industry's share is decreasing in GDP. And in England, we can also see the same parallelity. In Turkey, the situation is not different from the others. Post-2008 crisis, manufacturing share has dropped its value in the overall economy, an employment ratio is not a satisfying ratio. Unemployment should be declined. This is one of the hot agendas in our hot topics in our agenda. The United States, uh, their policies are dependent on decreasing the unemployment ratio. But when you look at the real reality, post 2008 crisis, the United States has understood the importance and priority of the unemployment. We can 
understand this. Production should be increased. Production industry should be endorsed and supported. And United States has always promoted and gave uh, initiatives to other countries. United States has no something without any acceleration and increase in the production. There will be no prosperity because there will be no employments. So there is a big correlation between the manufacturing production and welfare and prosperity of a country. Not only the decrease in the unemployment, but also other factors are very important. I want to show these factors to you. Let's look at China together. Industries share in GDP. The higher is G the higher the industries share in GDP, the higher the labor force in GDP. So when you look at the higher of the industry share in the country's economy, the higher the welfare and prosperity of the overall population. So we can understand the strength of the industry shows a big correlation with the population's welfare. Then we look at Southern Korea. There is a radical and significant increase from $10,000 per capita. This is the added value per capita GDP. It is right now above 40000 In Italy, we can also see the situation very clearly. The co correlation shows us uh, the same situation as well in Mexico. It is also one of the most important and example countries uh, in the emerging markets and developing countries. You can see the share of the industry is increasing in GDP, and we can also observe how the prosperity level has boomed after 2012. It is a very striking situation, actually. So all in all, we can say all the decisions and policies taken by decision makers and policy makers put stronger manufacturing and production industry in the basis of their decisions. I want to show you a different perspective. When you look at the slide, the four biggest countries in terms of GDP actually holds the 50% of world economy, China, Germany, Japan, and United States. And when it comes to manufacturing industries, it, this shows the same ratio. Those four countries hold the 50% of the manufacturing industry, so we cannot shift manufacturing towards other countries. In fact, United States has lost some industrial sectors in cheap labor force. China has grasped some sectors from United States. So right now, United States is trying to produce some policies. If you want to increase your GDP, you have to be stronger in your steel industry. We should not underestimate the power and the strength of the steel industry because it is the backbone of the manufacturing industry of a country. We say Japan, Germany, Southern Korea. When you observe those countries, in addition to their industries, their steel production in industries is very powerful. China has had the 70 percent has the biggest percentage in the steel production, but excluding China, there are some other seven important steel manufacturers, and their industry in general is also very powerful. With only trade and commerce activities, you cannot increase your prosperity and welfare level. Without steel sector, you cannot make it.
Because we talked about the trends in the world, the policymakers think some factors while they produce their policies, and we talk those factors. Yes, we do have many risks in our day. We cannot escape from those risks. There are some ups and downs, but the ones who are smarter can tackle with risks. They can use opportunities in those challenges. And in our geography that we are located in this region, there are many opportunities and we can understand where are they and we have to talk how these opportunities can be used. This is very beneficial if we discuss them together. Opportunities are very crucial. When you look at Turkey's situation in the decrease of petroleum oil prices, this decrease will affect Turkey very much. Petroleum oil price below $80 will decrease current deficit about $10 billion. And it can also has a declining effect by $4 billion in energy debts. So country's economy can be dependency on importation should be decreasing. These are not peculiar to our own country. These are done by many policymakers in other countries. And our policymakers should also observe the same things. This is not something on a paper, but what we should, there is a logic in is inside of these decisions. As, as And as industrialists, we should be able to see this picture and should see the importance of it, how fragile this is, how critical this is. All, and we can we should be able to see this all together. Turkey has a very potential uh, sector, has very potentials, great potentials. And one of the analysis that we acquired is this. Within eight or ten years of period in Turkey, the, the annual revenue that is $35,000 is expected to be, in the household, is expected to be doubled. And now our um, revenue is $1,000,000. Million. And with this, it is possible to see that we will reach a welfare state. And over a household, when there will be a revenue of $35,000 uh, Turkish lira, there will be a great growth. And as we see this growth, uh, there will be a great urbanization and moderation and an increase in welfare. And as a result of this, this growth rate should be even higher than it used to be, than it is now. So when we see the construction, it is 6% and the transportation is 10, 16%. And uh, we should be able to see, in, and the industry should be 6% six, six higher in order to reach such a welfare state. We have come to a, a great success for now. We have, and Turkey is, has been a country that is able to achieve such uh, great rates. And we should be able to take, uh, we should be able to work even harder in order to transform as a country, in order to develop the production and manufacturing industry, and we should be able to see the importance of this. And we should ponder a lot more upon this. The steel consumption uh, are mentioned, and we want to analyze this through different ways. Where was the steel consumption? Where was it 30 years ago? Where is it now? In the access, when we see uh, revenue income per capita, we were highly impressed by this when we see the numbers in, two, in 30 years ago. When you look at where the United States is 30 years ago, for example, and where, ha where it has gone to, it was where it used to be uh, like it was it used to be like us in uh, 30 years ago and Jap japan was uh, lower than us and as well as the eu and we see that they have taken great steps and they have grow grown a lot turkey has come to a certain place a certain step too but we have a long way to go a lot more way to go we have to work even harder so for the next generation, in order to reach to a common future, and if we want to contribute to our common future, we have to 
ponder, we have to think all together, and we have to find our role. We have to conduct our role, work on this, and think over. Turkey has a lot of ways to go. And when you see the uh, sizes of these rounds, of these circles, you see that Turkey 30 years ago, the industry 30 years ago, and now is a great, you know, a gap. There's a great uh, progress. But when you see the USA's uh, industrial development or the Japan's development, we see a great difference. We say that we said that USA is losing its blood and has challenging moments. But when you see the sizes, they are ahead of us. So our steel uh, consumption is high, and it's higher above the uh, EU and the USA. But still, besides that, we are in a very critical situation. We have to gain added value as a result of the steel consumption. USA is doing the same thing, but how are they consuming and how are they adding, gaining and adding added value? We have to think of these two. We have to concentrate on those facts. And with the collaboration and the common synergy and by contributing to our future, we have to think of how we can contribute to and increase an added value. In order to achieve and in order to be a welfare state, we have to work a lot and we have to achieve added value. When we talk about added value, we were always recently talking about an R&D trend, um, which is which has become quite popular, but this is not something empty. If we can't gain an added value, no matter how much of an income per capita we have, we cannot get over this middle uh, stage, middle class uh, level. Now, having talked all about all of these, we said, as we said earlier, we have a great potential. We have made a very slight analysis. We see that in the GDP, in the manufacturing industry, it is 15%. And Turkey is not doesn't have a, a big share in this. We see that, think that it has increased 2% within 10 years. And it has come to 17%, for example, within two years, let's say. And it has a potential and effect to increase the con steel consumption to 6 million tons. With a six additional 6 million tons in Turkey, I think the balances, if we could have achieved that, the balances in Turkey would have changed, would have been in a different place. With the, the industrialists and the place that they would be in would be in a different place. So with the sub demand of the country and the increase in the consumption, the welfare would have increased, the economy would have increased. And in Turkey, there are a lot of projects. There are a lot of potential projects. They're, they are focusing on infrastructure, about on roads, on uh, establishing new plants, industrial plants, and so on. No, the harder we work, the harder we achieve, the best, the, the best we gain, gain. And briefly, I would like to show the Ardemir Group to you with two slides. Added value is very important for us. It's very crucial for us. Innovation is important. What we can we have to put forward and innovate and put and develop our R and D hub in order to increase the steel consumption in the steel sector. And Ardemir Group has achieved that. We have put a great budget to the R and D hub to that center center. And with a thirty million dollars of uh, contribution, but we have established that R&D center. Uh, again, we I would like to sh show the shares of the R&D center, and we also talked about manufacturing industry, about steel consumption industries such as South Korea, Germany, Japan, and. When you look at the shares, you see in those countries the uh, expenditure of the R&D in those countries. And the number that Turkey puts forward is very sad. 
We have to collaborate all together. We have to be shoulder to shoulder, hand to hand, and reach to a common future. We have to see that we have a great, a long way to go. And again, we have our shares, and we are trying to use our capacity, challenge it, uh, because producing for this country is very crucial for us, because our main target is to produce for Turkey to reach to, uh, it's not to, it's, it's our main aim is not to reach to the global markets, but to increase uh, the sectors uh, in Turkey. We have to make differentiations. We have to differentiate ourselves from the others. This is, a, this is more like a didactic uh, presentation. When you look at the dynamics, uh, you see these. In many parts of my presentation, I have always talked about what we should do. This is a human psychology, in fact. But the, as we experience the world, we put forward some certain beliefs and values of ours. And this is what makes us as a, as a, as a society. So when we say what we should do, we, it means that we don't know how to take the first step. In fact, we can make it. When we say that we can make it, we can achieve it, we turn it into a belief. And the person who believes in that looks for ways to achieve it and knows how to achieve it, how to take stages. And as a country with a value, we believe that we can achieve it. And as we uh, generate such a belief, we, this, is, this belief will be healthier. There was a saying that I heard in the past. What, rather than giving the, what is more necessary for a, for a person uh, is hope rather than a breath, rather than an air or a blood. We have to work. We have to hope and we can achieve it. Thank you.